Welcome, my dear students and other viewers, to this, my continuing coverage of Chapter 11's discussion on liquids and intermolecular forces. I'm going to begin by introducing you to the first of the intermolecular, or IM, forces that we will learn. That is dipole-dipole. Okay, so whenever two atoms with different electronegativities bond, and if you want to review electronegativity, which is an atom's thirst for electrons, you're welcome to click a link in the description below that will take you to an older video in which I discuss that. So. Two atoms with different electronegativities bond with each other. They will share electrons unevenly. So uneven sharing of electrons is called polarity. Polar bonds share electrons unevenly. So they have a partial minus charge on the atom that is more electronegative and a partial positive charge on the atom that is less electronegative. So in polar molecules, that is molecules which as a whole have uneven sharing of electrons, cluster together, they line up and stick to each other complementarily, like this example of HCl. Partial minus on the chlorine sticks to a neighboring partial plus on a hydrogen of a neighboring molecule, kind of like magnets, positives and negatives being attracted to each other. This type of attraction is called dipole-dipole force, and the sticking of one molecule to its neighbor is what gives HCl its boiling or melting point. That segues beautifully into force number two, hydrogen bonding. So whenever you have a dipole-dipole force, like the one I just described, where the two bonded atoms are hydrogen with nitrogen, or hydrogen with oxygen, or hydrogen with fluorine, then the partial minus and positive charges are so strong that we actually give this category its own name, hydrogen bonding. To recap then, hydrogen bonding occurs whenever a hydrogen atom is directly bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine those three elements, which are the three most electronegative elements. Now this force, hydrogen bonding, functions just like dipole-dipole conceptually. That is, there's a strong partial minus on one atom and a strong partial positive on the hydrogen, except that it's so much stronger because of the larger electronegativity differences between hydrogen and nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Thus, even though conceptually it functions just like dipole-dipole, we give it its own name because it's so much stronger, hydrogen bonding. As an example, this diagram shows how the partial minus on one oxygen in one H2O molecule will bond intermolecularly through a hydrogen bond with the partial plus on a neighboring hydrogen atom of a neighboring H2O molecule. Now this bond right here is not a covalent bond. It's an intermolecular bond, hydrogen bond, which is much weaker than a covalent bond, but still strong enough to allow H2O molecules to stick to each other relatively tightly, which gives H2O its relatively high boiling point and melting point for its molecular weight. For example, H2O has a molecular weight of around 18, and yet you have to heat it at standard conditions all the way up to 100 degrees Celsius, which is very warm, to get it to boil. That is, to wiggle apart these molecules of H2O from each other, separated enough to get them to convert from a liquid to a gas. All of this is caused by hydrogen bonding, this very strong intermolecular force. Zooming in on this more closely then, the intramolecular bonds, that is the bonds between individual hydrogens and oxygen within an H2O molecule are covalent bonds, that is bonds between non-metals. But the bonds between two separate H2O molecules represented by this dot line here is a hydrogen bond because you have a hydrogen specifically bonded to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. Again, it confers a very strong, relatively speaking, melting or boiling point upon this molecule for its molecular weight. We see something similar with HF, which is hydrofluoric acid, and H3, ammonia, and combinations of these molecules, such as ammonia complementarily hydrogen bonding to a neighboring H2O molecule in one fashion or the other. This video, which I'll link to in the description below or as an in-video card, shows this beautifully using some really old school looking animation. That leads us to our next intermolecular force, ion dipole. So when you have a mixture of ionic compounds, and please remember, ionic compounds have metals and non-metals bonded to each other. And this table, by the way, will remind you which elements are metals and which ones are non-metals. Anyway, when you have an ionic compound, metals and non-metals, in your compound formula, in the presence of polar molecules, that is, molecules that have all non-metals in them, but a distinct dipole or even hydrogen bonding, in other words, an uneven sharing of electrons due to a difference in electronegativities between the bonded atoms, then the partial positive charge on the polar molecule will line up with the negatively charged ions in your ionic compound. And the partial negative charge on the polar molecule will line up with the positively charged cations from your ionic compound. This type of intermolecular force is called ion dipole. 
We can see, for example, when sodium chloride, NaCl, which is clearly an ionic substance, is dissolved in water, H2O, it looks kind of like this. The negatively charged chloride anion pointing its charge and bonding or interacting intermolecularly with a partial positive charge hydrogen atoms on the surrounding H2O molecules. By reverse analogy, the sodium cation does something similar with the partially negatively charged oxygen atoms in surrounding H2O molecules. This again is called ion dipole forces, which you get when an ionic compound, metals and nonmetals, is dissolved in a polar molecular, all nonmetal compound, which I hope then makes sense. Which takes us to ion force number four, dispersion forces. So just so you know, as elements, carbon and hydrogen atoms are almost equally electronegative. They're not exactly the same, but they're really, really close. So with this in mind, do you think this molecule right here, all carbons and hydrogens, is polar or nonpolar? Yeah, keep in mind that polar means that the electrons are shared unevenly, and nonpolar means that they're shared more or less evenly. Thus, this molecule will be nonpolar because its electrons are more or less shared evenly. Why? Because carbons and hydrogens are very close to equally electronegative. So one atom does not hog the electrons very much from the other or vice versa. Again then, nonpolar means evenly shared electrons and polar means unevenly shared electrons. Thus across this molecule, there's not really a distinct strong partial plus and partial minus anywhere because the electrons are more or less evenly distributed because carbons and hydrogens are close to equally electronegative. Make sense? It should make sense then that whenever two atoms are bonded to each other and those two atoms are the exact same element, or for the sake of this class, those two elements are carbon and hydrogen, then that bond will be nonpolar. And for my university students, I require you to memorize those facts. Two elements that are the same element, or if the two elements are carbon and hydrogen, that bond is nonpolar. There are other examples of nonpolar bonds, but for the sake of my class, we'll just leave it at that to keep it simple. Now, despite not having full or even partial charges, Nonpolar molecules still do have momentary partial plus and partial minus charges. How? Well, atoms and electrons, just so you know, are in constant motion. So there might be brief moments when their electrons have moved to one side of the atom, giving very temporarily one side of that atom a partial minus charge where those electrons are and a partial positive charge from the exposure of the protons in the nucleus when those electrons have fluxed over to one side. Does that make sense? So you have these brief moments of a partial minus charge on one side of an atom and a partial positive charge being exposed on the other side. You can see this featured in these two videos, which I will link to in the description beneath this video and possibly floating over my head as in video cards. So when two molecules with momentary partial plus and partial minus charges line up, they can actually stick to each other in a complementary way as depicted in this figure taken from our text, referenced in the description below. Once those molecules have stuck to each other, the electrons in each of these stuck together molecules or atoms will start to flux complementarily back and forth with each other, allowing those atoms to stay stuck together. This type of intermolecular force is called dispersion force, also known as London forces or Van der Waals forces. Now just so you know, all molecules, no matter what they are, have dispersion forces by default. So dispersion forces are possessed by all molecules, but all the other intermolecular forces I've described well, some of them are had by some molecules and not necessarily all molecules, based on the description. With all that said, to review, these are the intermolecular forces that we've discussed in this video. Ionic bonding, which happens, of course, when you have ionic compounds, compounds whose formulas have metals and nonmetals, followed by ion dipole. That's where you have an ionic compound dissolved in a polar molecular compound. Then hydrogen bonding, where you have hydrogen bonded directly to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine followed by dipole-dipole. Polar molecules, that is molecules containing atoms with polar bonds that do not have hydrogen directly bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. And lastly, dispersion forces, which is pretty much everything else. These are molecules that have two atoms of the exact same element bonded to each other, or an element all by itself, or carbons bonded to hydrogens. These intermolecular forces, which I require my students to remember, are sorted on this slide from bottom to top by increasing strength. So ionic bonds are the strongest, and dispersion are the weakest. Additionally, this flowchart taken from our text referenced in the description below can be used to be able to determine what type of intermolecular forces any given situation has. Now, how do IM forces affect boiling point? Well, as you might imagine, intermolecular forces are of course responsible for molecules boiling points or BPs. 
The stronger the intermolecular force, the more intensely molecules stick to each other. And the harder it is to get them to wiggle and break apart. And hence, the higher their boiling points will be. Thus, when comparing different molecules with similar molecular weights but different intermolecular forces, stronger intermolecular forces equals higher boiling point. Using, of course, the strength order that I just showed you in the previous slide. In any situation where you have different molecular weights but similar intermolecular forces, then higher molecular weight will equal higher boiling point because there's more surface area of interaction. Hence, more stickiness means more heat required to get them to wiggle apart, convert from liquid to gas, and boil. Additionally, when two molecules have only London forces, sometimes having a larger surface area can increase your boiling point. For example, chlorine Cl2 has a larger surface area and a higher boiling point than krypton, even though krypton has a higher atomic weight. That takes us to some beautiful intermolecular force problems. First, I want you to identify the type or types of ion forces present in each of these substances and then select based on the rules that I just explained, which substance in each pair has the higher boiling point. Now, I'm not going to do these right here, but I will post a link in the description below and possibly floating over my head to a separate video in which I explain it. And next, which type of intermolecular attractive force operates between all molecules, polar molecules, and the hydrogen atom of a polar bond and a nearby small electronegative atom? And lastly, which type of intermolecular force accounts for each of these differences? Methanol boils at this high temperature, whereas methyl thiol boils at a much lower temperature. Separately, xenon is a liquid at atmospheric pressure in 120K, whereas argon is a gas under these same conditions. And lastly, krypton with this atomic weight boils at 120.9K, whereas chlorine with its molecular weight much lower boils at a much higher temperature. Now, as a hint, I might have actually just answered this one a couple of slides ago. In any event, I hope this video has been of value to you. I know I've had an enjoyable time. Until my next one then, my dear students and others, please have an enjoyable rest of your day. Oh, my God.